I changed my lecture a little bit compared to last year. I'm going to focus mostly in the advantages of CT compared to other type of modality. And I put in a little bit of a basic concept. So just for the new fellows or for fellows who haven't done CT before, they can understand it a little bit better. And some of the slides actually from Dr. Uh, Navi's lecture. So he's not here, but for disclaimer, let him know I, dis I did disclaim that I'm using some of his slides. OK, why do we do cardiac CTA? You know, we have echo, MRI, cath. Um, so one of the main reason is uh, CT could be considered one of the probably most versatile techniques to have a comprehensive assessment of cardiac structure from the coronary to the bowel to the ventricle to the big vessels, um, atrium. You can look at lumen stenosis, plaque composition, ear ejection fraction, perfusion, and now we can even do FFR. So some of the future CT is the best in the field. Some of them obviously is not as good as MRI, for instance, uh, myocardial fibrosis, scar imaging, CT. Resolution is not as good as MRI, but we can, you know, if someone needs scar imaging, hyper enhancement imaging with CT, it could be done as well. So, just real basic stuff, okay? So, on the left hand side, this is what you're going to see. I don't see you seeing the arrows, huh? Can you see the arrow? No? Oh, no. Do you guys see the arrow or not really? No, huh? Uh, okay. Do we have a pointer? Anyway, so on the left-hand side, that's what a, car a CT unit looks like, OK? If you strip the cover in the, uh, in the left lower panel, you can see it uh, consists of X-ray tube with emit X-ray photons. It has a collimator right in front of it, so it doesn't produce too much scatter. Uh, the object you want the image go to the, in the middle of the, thank you. Okay, let's see. I don't think it's working well here. Yeah. Okay. Uh. Well, I give up. Okay, so you can see, and, and then you have a array of detectors, okay, where you capture the, the um, photon that goes through the objects, and then go through a um, series of digital manipulation, and they come out the image that you use to see in the workstation. Okay, so what are the major advantages of CT, the reason why we do CT, okay? Number one, is has a very high spatial resolution the best in the class for all the non-invasive testing. Uh, isotropic voxel resolution, we're going to go through that a little bit later, has very high contrast resolution. Uh, this is also very important, very fast acquisition time and the large anatomical coverage for a sick patient. Um, you cannot lay flat for a long period of time or you want to evaluate a large area. Um, CT is the way to go. And uh, either you like it or not, you're going to see a lot of all, every single structure outside the heart, okay? which could be a, a very big advantage. Because when you want to do certain type of intervention, you have the landmark, 
and um, to, to guide you for either invasive or uh, percutaneous or, or, or open chest surgery. 3D rendering, um, I think, has, is, it looks very pretty. Everyone wants to look at 3D images. As it has its own limitation, but in certain circumstances, it could be very useful. And I think dynamic images uh, pose one of the probably most exciting application of the CT, okay? So this image is a self-explanatory. That's why we do CT, because you get gorgeous picture like this, okay? Um, just almost like the real objects. And, uh, and how do we achieve image like this, okay? Number one, the most important thing that we do ECG gating, okay? I don't need to explain to you what systole and diastole mean because I hope I don't have to. And how we do it is basically throughout the our interval, you break down in different part of the cardiac cycle, you know, early diastole, early systole. So when the scanner go around the heart, for each part of the heart, you want to stitch exactly the same cardiac cycle so it can match the heart shape and size and uh, so the object will look uniform, okay? Same principle with, you know, the old 3D TEE, same principle with spec and also with MRI. This is uh, ECG gating, it's a, it's a must. And you can do it with two way. Um, you know, when the, when the scanner go around the heart, you can go continuously in a helical fashion that means the uh, body, so the scanner is on the whole time as it moves through uh, the heart. Or you can do what we call step and shoot or prospective gating. Basically, scanner, scan, go around the heart, stop, and then advance, stop, and then advance. So this has, this has important in terms of um, um, reducing the radiation, and in, the, in case of the um, helical scan, it allows you to have multiple informa uh, information throughout the cardiac cycle, and that's uh, essential for functional imaging. Okay, this is an example of why, this is why we do gated study, okay? You can see up there in the aorta, ascending aorta, non-gated study, I mean, you have what we call hurricane sign, you know, a little bit artifact because aortic root moves believe it or not, obviously, it's connected to the left ventricle. And you can see with the Gatiss study, it's actually a dissection, okay? So when you look at the literature in the aortic dissection, sometimes it quotes, you know, diagnostic accuracy of dissection using CTA is in the low 90s. I mean, those are an era when they do non gated study. I mean, if you do Gatiss study, I don't think you will ever miss uh, an aortic dissection. So that's why we do Gatiss study, okay? And CT, obviously, we're using now for coronary CT to look at the stenosis. <coughs> this is a patient with uh, pretty tight left main, distal left main, proximal LAD stenosis with, with corresponding cath images, okay? So this is the bread and butter. That's why we do CT. Uh, and the reason we can look at the degree of stenosis in a moving object like the coronary arteries or the heart, because the special resolution, among other things, the special resolution of the heart uh, CT is, 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 is excellent. Uh, because we give contrast, the contrast has very high attenuation compared to uh, arterial wall, so we are able to see very differential, differential very well, the arterial lumen with the surrounding structure with a height, with a very big difference. So that's how we can see, actually. And that, in a sense, translates into spatial resolution, which in, in physics, in, in a mathematic term, uh, the, the, correct, the term they use usually is line pair per millimeter, meaning that, you know, the point that each individual stripe could be differentiated one from the other. So if you have 
let's say one line pair per millimeter means you can fit two line, okay, within one millimeter, you can still tell them apart. So if you have one line pair per millimeter, technically your spatial resolution will be 0 0.5 millimeter. Yeah? Make sense? And the right hand side, that's just a way, you know, to display uh, how a different line pair trans translate into uh, spatial resolution. Okay, so how good is CT? CT could, in, in plane resolution, I mean X, Y axis or the axial images that you look at, for instance, uh, depending on the geographic characteristics of the scanner, they vary between 0 0.4, 0 0.6, so usually around 0 0.5. The through plane is the Z axis, right? It's the thickness, and that depends usually the detector's width, okay? And the uh, thinnest detector has been made is 0 0.5 millimeter. Uh, you, can a you might ask me, so technically, theoretically, you can make the spatial resolution even smaller, 0.1, if you can engineer a detector of 0 0.1 millimeter, right? Technically, which is true. The problem is when you have very thin detector, each detector being so thin, the signal you capture is not going to be very, very much. So actually, you're going to have very noisy picture. You would have to increase the photon energy. So, so that's why a thin detector hasn't been working very well, because you need to give a lot of radiation to overcome that. How good is that compared to invasive angiogram you do in the cath? OK, it's, cath is still much better, right? Besides, you know, remember, you're injecting the contrast directly into the coronary artery versus venous injection. So that contrast resolution even better, and that in a sense translates into a better spatial resolution, okay? And why is this important, right? How many of you gone through the uh, CT lab? Nobody? Quite a few, yeah? Okay, so when you see a stenosis, like this one, okay? So you see the picture between the cath and the zoom in, the coni zoom in picture, uh, image of the cath in the left-hand side versus in the CT. I mean, still is a big difference. You know, cath is still much better because the spatial resolution is five to 10 times better, okay? And the importance is this. When we do CT, you know, whoever read with me, you know I never report percentage of stenosis. It's a reason why. What's that? What's the size of coronary, uh, Omar? Like four millimeters. Four millimeter proximal artery, correct? Mm -hmm. Left main five, maybe six. When you come down to the branches of the vessel, 1.5, two. Okay, you have 1.5 millimeters, two millimeter arteries, and your spatial resolution is 0.6. That means you can at most fit two to three lines in there, okay? So two to three line, you do the math, that means you, if you're off by one, that's one third, that's 33%, right? So, if, you know, measuring, so that's why quantitative coronary CTA is not feasible. Does that make sense? You can measure all you want, you can say it's 50%, but if you do a coronary quantitative invasive angiogram, it could be the plus minus is about 17 percent and this has been studied in this uh, I would say landmark study right comparing quantitative coronary CTA versus quantitative invasive angiogram I mean the correlation is very good right but look at the scatter okay so if you look at panel B you can see the difference the standard deviation is, is around 27%. That means if you call a stenosis of 50% in CTA, it could be either 23 or 77% in invasive angiogram. All right, so know the limitation. That's why the guideline of the society is for you not to report 75% stenosis, okay? or even 70% stenosis. You give a range because that's all you get. Very important. 
Okay, next, obviously, main advantage of CTA is it's probably about the only non-invasive technology that you can use to look at coronary plaque. You know, MRI allows you to see big vessels, you know, carotid, aortic plaque. Uh, obviously, CT can do that, uh, but for coronary, not only you can see the plaque, you can kind of differentiate the different component of the plaque, like in the left-hand side, you can see the very tight LAD uh, at left main, uh, mostly actually it's a, it's a proximal LAD stenosis. You can see it's very dark, right, compared to the lumen, that's hypoattenuation. So that usually speak of, uh, we, we, we label it as a non-calcific plaque, but if you measure the Huntsville unit, it could be lipid rich. And further down, that's, I, I believe that's a diagonal, or I think it's a diagonal. I see, you can see it's actually have speckle of the calcium there with a little bit of a non-calcific plaque, because it's a mixed plaque there. Compared to the one in the right-hand side, you know, essentially the plaque is almost exclusively calcific, okay? And how do we do that? How does CT do that, right? Uh, basically, um, CT detect the difference of attenuation between the tube and the detector, okay? And how much the energy photon, photon is being attenuated depending on the composition of the material, okay? Denser the material, higher the attenuation. So that's kind of, so, you, so basically you produce attenuation profile, you, you reconstruct the images, and depending on, we express in a, in a gray scale. So depending on the density value, which we express that as Huntsville unit, you can see by definition, water is zero, okay? So if you see something with a zero of a Huntsville unit or 10 or 20, most likely is liquid, okay? A lot without contrast, about 50 or 60. Lung, obviously for air, very little, low density, very negative, and fat, it's not as dense as water, so give you negative. So basically the plaque that we saw you have a house of a unit of negative 50, 70, or 100, you know that's probably cholesterol rich plaque, correct? And calcium, as you can say, obviously is very high, metal is even higher, over 1,000. And when you do contrast, hopefully you want to achieve around contrast, around 300, 350 in the coronary for the study to be diagnostic, because the soft tissues could be around 100. And obviously in the middle, ranges for soft tissue, uh, CTs cannot resolve whether it's a tumor, is a muscle, or scar tissue, or clot, because there's a lot of overlap, okay? In that range, obviously, MRI is much better. Okay, this is just a case. Omar, what diagnosis this patient has? Aneurysmal, okay, yes. So LAD has proximal aneurysm, okay, with some in the left-hand panel. No significant stenosis, right? Has some calcific plaque in the wall and some maybe dark tissue around, I don't know, that could be clot, could be, and the RCA is occluded, correct? In the right-hand side. Right here. Okay. So this is the aneurysm, aneurysm with calcific wall, and this obviously probably clot. Probably, right? This is occluded. So what's the diagnosis? 44 years old from Vietnam. He's a police officer. It's Houston Police Department. So what, the, what, what does he have? Or what did he have? Kawasaki, correct. Okay. Next function. Okay. So, so Mohammed, what's the diagnosis? In the left hand side. So. Yeah, correct. So, 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 
So you CT, if you do, if you acquire the image throughout the cardiac cycle, you're going to have systole and diastole. And you can see the LV function, LV size. And again, you know, CT is the non-invasive technology that, that achieve volume and, and EF assessment closest to the MRI for obvious reason, right, compared to echo, 3D echo. So you can see the size, EF, wall motion, assessment of uh, um, and pseudo aneurysm in this case because if you trace that, uh, there's no pericardium around it. And obviously, right now we're doing a lot of valve imaging. Uh, it's very easy to see the valve motion. And I would say CT is, uh, again, even more better than fluoroscopy. The reason being fluoroscopy, you're not sure if you're really exactly uh, in tangential view or, or parallel view um, of the uh, leaflet opening with CT because the 3D nature of the acquisition, you can rotate and acquire exactly uh, the view you want and, and, and calculate the opening and closing angle. In this case, you can see obviously one of the leaflets is stuck. Other major advantage of CT is really fast acquisition time and you cover large anatomical area. And the reason being that we have very, very wide coverage CT. So 64 slide CT, that's probably the most the CT scanner that you're going to uh, be using uh, out there for coronary imaging. Cover about four centimeter, okay? So and the, and the normal size heart in the, in the cranial caudal range is about 12, 10 to 12 centimeter. So but if you want to get the coronary in, usually you need to go around the heart four times, four, four to six times, depending on the protocol you use. Uh, so, so using 64, CT, 64 slices CT, you acquire the image of the heart in about 40, 48 seconds, which is pretty, still pretty good, right? With the newer 256, 320 detector CT, they can cover 16 centimeters. So essentially one rotation cover the whole heart, and one rotation usually is about 200. I think the new G scanner, one rotation. It's about 270, 260 milliseconds. So less than a second, you get the whole heart. Uh, no other technology could do that. Very useful for people who cannot cooperate. Uh, so it's kind of an example of uh, uh, 64 slices, OK? So patient move along this table of move, and, uh, and uh, gantry has to rotate four to five times six to ten times in order to get the heart. In the bottom part, uh, I don't think it's, is it playing? Yeah. So basically, one single rotation, you get the images. One beat, essentially, okay? And other reason why scan is so fast, obviously, the gantry go really, really fast. Uh, I think our CT scanner is upstairs, is 250 millisecond rotation time. That's uh, over three, 35G. Uh, and that's the reason why they cover the, 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 C, the scanner, right? So otherwise, no patient want to go in there. Uh, in addition, the, the gantry b being really fast, um, our scanner upstairs, the table can move very quickly too, OK? You can see the difference between the conventional scanner and our ultra fast mode or high pitch mode or flash mode, uh, whatever you want to call it. So it allows you to cover 87 centimeter of the body in one second. So an average person, essentially, the, you can scan from head to toes in two, two seconds, OK? So look at the ECG, when you see the green flash, that's where the scan occurs. So with this mode, 
87 centimeter per second, coverage is hard, all you need is 207 millisecond. Okay. Example of one of the first Tavar we did with this scan mode. This you can obtain uh, the major vessel of the body from neck down to the groin in 1.4 second. Okay, the next one we do CT because everybody want to look at picture like this, right? Because it's intuitive. You know what you're looking at. It looks pretty, obviously. Surgeons love it. And uh, so the main advantage of this is not because it's pretty, okay? The main advantage of this is it gives you better understanding of the spatial relationship between the structure that you want to see in the pathology. So that's the key thing. And that hopefully will help you uh, improve your uh, whatever procedure you want to do in, in the cardiovascular. And how we achieve that is we do something we call overlap. Uh, in the reconstruction. Uh, imagine if we take single slices and stitch them together, there's always some, some um, minor difference between slice and slice. You know, if you have a lot of slices, it becomes even more noticeable, okay? So you can see in the left-hand side, without overlap, if we just stack the data one on top of the other, I mean, it looks okay, but it doesn't look great. But if you overlap the images, um, things become more uh, uninterrupted and it, it looks more like the real thing, I should say. So that's one thing we do. And the other thing is the key things about CT is you have what we call isotropic resolution. That means that for all the three axes, the resolution is the same. So it doesn't matter which plane you want to look at, how you manipulate the images, the the dimension you look at is exactly the same. The relationship is the same. Uh, so, so you can create what we call isotropic voxel. So basically a little cube with exactly identical resolution in each side. So there's no distortion, uh, no loss of data, okay? And on top of it, you can add it in motion and that help you uh, go through, you know, avoid foreshortening and um, get a better understanding of the spatial distribution of the, of the coronary artery. Which, by the way, uh, I think, personally, I think for all the fellows who go to the cath lab, that's their first rotation, you all have to come downstairs to the CT lab, rotate it around, you understand why you want to do RAO 40 for a certain part of coronary segment. Before, you know, I did CT, you know, I you have to try to imagine, you know, using Dr. Raisner's ice cream cone example uh, to see why you want to stretch the part of the coronary that you want to see. But with CT, it's really become so intuitive. So I strongly recommend the first year fellow before they go to cath lab, just, you know, come to the CT lab look at some data sets, and you rotate, you understand perfectly why you want to do certain projection. Okay, and the importance is, for instance, is, I think this case illustrates a little bit why CT is important in, uh, in the uh, compare, you know, even in a junction to other type of cardiovascular imaging modality. This is a patient who show up with right heart failure, CO underwent coronary angiogram, obviously something wrong. Uh, so in this case, because of the pathology the patient have, and the RCA basically, you know, you can see this tortuous, most likely a fistula, because you cannot opacify the RCA well enough. I mean, you can see in this case, coronary CT has better resolution than, than, than invasive angiogram, just because, you know, the volume you need will contrast have been huge. And I don't want to say the MRI doesn't give you a good picture, but, uh, you know, you get the, diag I mean, you got the diagnosis. I mean, you do, so what's coronary CTA good for in this case, for instance? You know, you already have the diagnosis. Patient of coronary, probably venous fistula, and uh, 
the Rihar fair. So compared to the image, it looks much better, right? But what, what's the main reason why we do CTA? You already have the diagnosis. So what, what do you think? Ma. For surgical planning. Yeah. Why is it important for this case? You want to see the origin and the determination of the fistula. Exactly. You know where to start. So, so you want to know. And that's why it's important. CT give you a relationship with an uh, anatomical landmark because you know, when surgeon goes in, they, go, they don't just look at the heart only, right? I mean, they, they know where they are, where the structure is based on other structures. So basically, you can see clearly, for instance, this case in the right-hand side, how the, how the fists are draining to the coronary sinus, okay? And the distance of the, of the communication in relationship to the descending aorta, okay? So basically, make that surgeon job a lot easier. You know, I think Dr. Laurie operating, he goes in there, he finds a descending aorta, and, and you, know where the, you know where to ligate these things, okay? It won't be the first time. I, I think this was a case as well. A patient has actually two communication. So uh, if you hadn't known that before, uh, it would have been incomplete procedure. Okay. I think we went through this last year, but I think it's important because everybody wants 4D CT. Can somebody tell me when was this 4D CT technology developed? Okay. It's so about 30 years ago people have done that. So this is not a new technology. But I, but I think it's a concept that you guys need to understand what does 4D CT and people use that one dynamic CT, what does that mean? Uh, so I'm going to try to, I mean, it's, it's a lot of confusion because the terminology is uh, being used interchangeably without, without specific, specifically, without specification in terms of what kind of protocol you want to use because you get different images depending on different protocol. So for me, dynamic images is anything that's not static, okay? So when you inject contrast to enhance a vascular compartment, first part is going to highlight, when you inject into the vein, for instance, which, you know, it goes to the right, ventricle, right side, and they go to the left ventricle. But if you look at an organ, for, for instance, if you want to look at organ perfusion, per se, right, the blood come in through the arteries, go to the capillary, go to the vein, and, and get out, right? So you can construct what we call time intensity curve. You can look at, you know, in the, in the left ventricle, in the myocardium, and you look at how the blood goes in and go out depending on the arterial phase, capillary phase, or tissue phase, or venous phase. An example I show you here is, for instance, the left-hand side, that's before the contrast was injected, which, by the way, this is a similar thing that they used to do in the cath lab for, all right, for, for hemodynamic assessment. And you inject the contrast, so most, well, that's exactly most of the contrast in the right side, some contrast already arrived in the left side. And the panel in the middle, you can see the right side is completely gone, there's no more contrast, and the contrast right now mostly is in the left side of the heart. You can see even the descending aorta in the bottom of each panel, you know, gradually get brighter, right? The, the bottom panel is the venous face, so basically, essentially, the contrast already gone through the body and returned to the IVC, as you can see. Uh, in, the, in the bottom, bottom uh, panel here, this structure that's highlighted here, right here, is a coronary sinus, okay? So basically, the blood has went through the vein and returned to the... So, so that's, for me, that's the true dynamic images. So you image the, the different phase of a, a circulation of the same organ. Different from what we do 
uh, most of the time in our lab, gated, ECG gated cardiac, cardiac CTA, which is also dynamic because it moves, right? But we're not imaging exactly the same thing because we specifically image certain part of this uh, circulation. Most of the time we interest in the coronary, so we image in the arterial phase, right? The reason it moves is because we image the patient in different part of cardiac cycle, systole and diastole. Okay? So this is cardiac specific. Uh, so you image it, you can image, choose image the art arterial phase, you can in, and you can play systole and diastole. So all you're seeing is arterial phase in systole and diastole. Or you can image when the vein, when the blood is already in the cardiac vein, you get also system diastole of the venous phase. I'll show you an example, okay? So for me, 4D CT should be reserved. It will be easier to understand is you want 3D images of the CT in movement, in motion, with the time uh, as a variable. The time could be a variable, either system and diastole, okay? Or it could be through the arterial venous phase. So this, so 4D CT could be either through the cardiac cycle or through the arterial venous cycle. So I'll show you some example. I think we did this exercise last year. Let me ask. Uh, Miguel. So is this, is this 4D CT? Why? It's 3T and it's 3D and it moves. So why is it not? <laughs> Absolutely, we're not seeing that for sure. We're not seeing the transition, okay? Even, we're not even seeing, this is probably just mostly the contrast is in the, in the, in the, arter in the arterial phase because you see how much how well you see, you see the aorta in the coronary. So most of the contrast, your image is doing about ar the arterial phase. It moves because I just spin it, that's all. Okay. How about here? Is this 4D CT? Yes, right? At least in the left-hand side, right? So what's the diagnosis there? Is it rich? Correct, yeah. So, see the milking effect that you see in the angiogram? In this case, we, 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 we did 3D rendering of the entire heart with the coronary tree, and we played through the cardiac cycle of system diastole, all right, obviously. The compression occurs during the system. And that explains why myocardial breach probably does not have significant pathological consequences because in diastole, lumen is widely patent. That's where the coronary perfusion occurs. Okay. That's probably the reason why you don't want to put a stand in there because imagine. How about this? Alpanite, this is 4D. <coughs> It is 4D, correct? You see the, it's a 3D rendering and you see the, how the mitral valve close and open, right? So you're seeing cystic and diastole. So this is cardiac 4D CT. And that's what most of the people order, right? Same here, you know, you can, you can, you can display uh, the beauty of CT, this different way of displaying the data sets. Uh, left hand side is what we call MIP. So basically you maximize the display of image with very high high attenuation factor in this case in a ball and cage valve and in the right hand side you do a 3d rendering essentially you get rid of all the uh, structure with very low Hansfield unit and all you left is you know the, uh, the structure so this is this is a uh, this is also 4D CT. <coughs> the difference is 
um, using supercomputer algorithm, basically divided the cardiac cycle into 50 phases, okay? Um, usually we display the image that I show you, we display the cardiac cycle in 10 phases, so you have 10 data set per cardiac cycle, and this computer algorithm use obviously uh, not regular workstation, it's still uh, in for research purposes. But I think it holds some potential in, in assessment of the myocardial velocity, hopefully strain imaging. Uh, and this is what most of the uh, valve service and surgeon wants, right? So it's not playing. It's too bad, let me see. So this is a 4D, this is a valve thrombosis. It looked a little bit choppy because we didn't, we didn't acquire the entire cardiac cycle. We just acquired, I think, half of the cardiac cycle, so, okay. And that's another example of a 4D CT. You can see the dissection flap. And uh, I think this is also useful for you to understand, you know, when we used to know that, okay, you know, dissection, spiral dissection, you know, you, you kind of imagine that, but you actually, you see it uh, with this display. So this is the dynamic images, dynamic CT that I prefer, I prefer to reserve dynamic CT for this type of image. So here we're looking at uh, endoleak, right? Here we're not looking at cystic or diastole. Here we're looking at how the blood get in, how you get out, so like organ perfusion. You want to see arterial, tissue, and venous space, okay? You see how the blood come in and then get out and then uh, through the feeding vessels, okay? So this is an example of a you see. The application in the heart would be myocardial perfusion. Yes? You see how the blood is showing up in the right, right heart first? For people who have done MRI, it's very similar to the MRI perfusion, right? So here, actually, the display is, is doing, uh, doing tacitly, I believe. Um, you can do it non-gated as well, okay? So for those who were reading with me last Friday, we're talking about, remember the Friday case that we struggle, you know, the Venus delay phases, what we've seen is real, not real. So currently what we do for runoff, you know, we do, technically you do a pre-contrast scan, you do arterial space scan, you do a delay scan, right? And the problem is you never know by the time your image is, you know, if we're too early, too late, right? Arterial face, you know, if, if the patient has so severe disease, the normal vessel is gonna fill out quickly and the, and the diseased vessel might not fill up, right? Same thing with the delay. How, 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 how late after you inject the contrast, you try to see the late filling of the, you know, for, from collaterals. So it's a crap shoot, right? I mean, you can scan and you can hope you get the right face. But most of the time, you know, in runoff, the disease process is different and every vessel is gonna, disease vessel might not feel exactly on the same time. But if you have this, basically your image is before the contrast come in, gets in, and how it gets out. So you're not gonna miss any, miss anything. And besides, remember the, the vessel that we saw, so, so diseased, they have a lot of calcium. And you see, because of blooming artifact, you don't know if it's just you're seeing the signal from the calcium blooming or surreal, a little bit of contrast. But with this, 
I mean, you can see clearly differences, right, in different phases. This is a lot of, uh, I mean, the vascular surgeon are very excited about this uh, because, but personally, peripheral vascular disease is not something I'm interested in, but and when you sow disease, sure, you can pick up a little bit of vessel, t you know. I, I, you've seen this before. I think it was pretty neat, right? I mean, it's nothing not related to the cardiac, but this is what people, for plastic surgeon, they want to, you know, remove a, a graft, a flap. Uh, but it's very important that when they move the flap, they need to make sure the feeding vessel is, is good. And where is the feeding vessel? Because if you cut it, you cut the feeding vessel, you can put the flap, but it's gonna, gonna die, right? Don't ask me what arteries are there. Alpana, are you gonna find out what arteries are there? So essentially, this has been studied, like, you know, uh, by knowing where you're gonna go in before and what vessel try to, you wanna, you know, you wanna avoid the, uh, the, the surgical injury, you can save a lot of time. Uh, okay, so uh, I think that's all I have this time, and uh, next time I'm gonna talk about, all oh, this is very good, you know, I'm showing you the, the best cases, great application by anything else. There's an ugly side to it, uh, but I get you excited first, right? And then if I show you the bad stuff first, you probably just don't even, but anyway. Uh, but it's important for us to be honest to ourselves in terms of uh, all the uh, cool technologies has its own limitations, so, so we know when to do it and when to use it. Any question? No question. Good.